Ladies and gentlemen, listeners, lovers, and friends, welcome back to the podcast at Two Ticks and the Dog Productions. I am your host, Jim Fogarty. Our guest today is my uncle, Frank Castellano. If you've got a restaurant or a bar or you're looking for some entertainment at your private party, this is the guy you want to call. The reason I'm having him on the show is not only has he written a plethora of music uh, and jingles, we actually many, many moons ago, uh, won an award for a jingle for a local uh, restaurant that we created, uh, that we, the jingle we created for a restaurant. And he also uh, contributed one of my all-time favorite songs. Uh, Some of you know or may or may not know that I produced a film back in my 20s called Waxing Gibbous, and uh, it's got some great music on it. Uh, Guys like uh, uh, Gary Lee and the Cat Daddies and Good Brother Earl and Secret Agent Band, and Steve Vuich, The River Saints. And one of my favorite songs on it is a song by Frank Castellano, our next guest. It is called Night Falls. It's super. And he actually is now working on a new album, his first album of all originals. He had an album that he released years ago uh, called In a Mellow Tone, which is is, is actually one of my favorite albums to chill out to. Uh, This one is all originals. Uh, that's coming out, and we're going to talk about it in this next episode. But first, let's take care of some bookkeeping. We are being a broadcast above Dave Grohl Alley from Two Ticks and the Dog Productions, and that's going to be our big sponsor today. We're video production. We do production for TV, radio, on-screen cinema, and digital display, and that's really what I want to talk about. I just want to give you some info. If you're a business owner and you have a website and you are either using your marketing funnel to drive viewers to your website so that they can find out more about your business, you may want to contact us because we are experts in the field of digital display, rich media content advertising. Here is here's some stats. These are the number of online sources consulted before someone went to purchase or before someone went to vote. So listen to these numbers. Number of online sources consulted for voters, 14.7. Automotive, 18.2. Technology, like if you're going to buy like a new phone or you're going to buy something tech-wise, 14.8. Number of online sources consulted for insurance, 11.7. Banking, 10.8. Travel, 10.2. Investment, 8.9. Before they went to a new grocery store, 7.3 7.3 before they went to a health center or a health store online sources consulted 9.8 restaurants 5.8 so you're on the web you're searching for things like let's just say you're a restaurant okay and someone's trying to find oh i want to go get something to eat and they search you know italian cuisine or mexican cuisine or asian cuisine whatever it is not only do you want to have a great website But while people are on the web searching on their mobile device or on their tablet or on their computer, you want to be popping up in digital display ads that are hyperlinked back to your website or back to your Facebook page, depending on what you got going on. How do you do that? You call Two Ticks and the Dog Productions, and we will set you up with a program that has a high click-through rate and that delivers rich media content. That means it's not just one static image, it's multiple images with multiple messages that are sure to drive buyers to your website. So that's our big pitch. That's our big sponsorship today. Today's podcast is sponsored to you by Two Ticks and the Dog Productions. I wanted to tell you about some purchase influences. We do all kinds of other stuff too, but that is the big one. And of course... The thing that's fueling me, the thing we're going to talk about in June, I'm going to have a very special guest on to talk about biohacking. Yes, I've been talking about it from the very beginning. He's actually coming on the air. Uh, His name is Dr. Gene DeLucia. Okay, he's going to be talking about some amazing products that I've been turned on to and just some health practices in general that can keep you healthy, strong, uh, keep weight off of you, uh, you know, People have been saying to me, they've been seeing me, they're like, oh man, you look great. Or, man, you, you lost some weight. Or, you know, you're, what are you doing? 
you've kept some weight off. I've actually, in the last four years, uh, have dropped about 20 pounds. Uh, I feel great. I feel healthier and I'm more energetic than I ever was. Uh, how did I do it? Part of it was exercise. Part of it was some lifestyle change. But part of it was because I was willing to do the things today to biohack tomorrow. Boom. Biohacktomorrow.com. One of the big things I talked about it last time. Hey, man, you want a little boost in your energy? There's an energy drink at biohacktomorrow.com called Axio. It's smart energy. And what does that mean? It's an all-day brain performance product that provides sustained energy. It improves your mood. It enhances your concentration and your focus. This stuff is true. You can look up the ingredients. When you go on that site, there's an ingredient list. And you can go Google or go to PubMed or go wherever you need to to find out all these awesome ingredients included in this Axio and how it can benefit your body, your mind, and your spirit. So, you want to get kicking butt today? Biohacktomorrow.com. Without further ado, I don't want to talk anymore. I've been talking too long. Let's get to the show. Ladies and gentlemen, Frank Castellano. Three, two, one. Welcome, Frank Castellano. Thank you. For, <laughs> <laughs> this, I have to say, this is the 11th episode we just got through 10 thank you for everyone for listening frank is our brandon actually coined this today this is our extended uh goal two. see how many we can get to etc but this is the first one i bring all that up because this is the first one where i was actually nervous ahead of time why right why were you nervous <laughs> because you know so prodders out there frank and i are nephew uncle uh frank is my uncle he's my mother's brother and he brandon uh for your benefit and for everyone else that's listening you know is a big reason that i got into the arts and was inspired by music and you know we come from a very i, I would say very i mean I, don't know, I guess that's all relative but we come from a, a fairly uh I'll just say it. I'm trying to qualify it. We come from an artistic family. Right. My grandmother is a great freehand sketch artist. She plays, you know, organ and piano by ear. Uh, my grandfather, Frank's uh, dad, you know, was probably one of the best pure storytellers, you know, growing up. He was up. a great storyteller. Uh, yeah. And, you, and <laughs> Frank is too. So that's what's, it's awesome to have him on to do this. I think I was nervous because like, I, and I've said this before, like it, it's a corny term probably, but Frank's like my guitar hero. Right. Like I grew up going out listening to Frank at a very young age. I tease my mom and go, you know, mom, you were like a hippie. I don't know if that's necessarily true, but probably not. No. <laughs> <laughs> she likes the term now though. She's yeah. like, oh, I was. <clears throat> but you know, we have pictures of like going to these things that, you know, uh, Alex Bevan and, and Frank was in Godspell. And I grew up, you know, like uh, idolizing him and looking up to him uh, and, and, and listening to his music. And so- And look how- I think it's a great out. thing. You know? <laughs> Some people's heroes are- they're um, sports guys. They're they're they play in movies, and yours is blood. I mean, what what better than that? So don't be nervous. <laughs> Let's have a great time. Yeah, this is going right. to be a fun time, right. man. I'm super pumped too. But I was like, where do I start, and where should? So where do we start with your first interest in music? Did it come before the guitar was introduced, or did it come after? And walk us through that. All right. So I've told the story a bunch of times, but um. My, uh, I had a cousin who lived with us. He was from New York, and he lived, after he got out of the service, he came to Warren and lived with us for a while. Who, who Johnny was Pagello. Johnny Pagello. Did you ever meet Johnny? I, I don't think so. Uh, anyhow, he, uh, he was a guitar player, but a really good one, too. And uh, so my parents, you know, they always wanted me to play the guitar, but I was five. I had, I, had a, I had a little plastic guitar, Gene Autry guitar. There was a picture of me when I was five, way before I played the guitar. Did it have guitar. cowboys and stuff on it? it? Yeah, it had cowboys. <laughs> <laughs> it did. And, uh, and I, <laughs> How old were you at this point? I was five. Uh, we lived wow. on Charles Street then. Anyhow, so five years later, because I was 10 years old, and uh, my father was at somebody's house. And this woman had mentioned uh, that she was going to throw away this guitar and would. And my father said, well, if you're going to throw it away, I'll take it. And so he brought it home and he said, you want to take guitar lessons? And I said, yeah, sure, why not? Because, you know, I was 10. That was I going to say. 
So um, I, I was really lucky. There was a my parents used to go dancing at the Emirates Hall Club, and um, they had a band there. And the guitar player in the band was a guy named Phil Plaskin, great man, great teacher. And from the very beginning, um, I just had an aptitude for it. And I had a teacher that used to give me lessons and grade me just like he would in school. And he would tell my father, uh, yeah, he didn't practice this week. Well, that was like you know, <laughs> the hammer came down because we were paying $2 for the lessons. And then, you know, I wasn't going to buy. This is 1950? 62. 62. I was 10 years old, yeah. Oh, right, right, okay. And, you know, he told my um, teacher, uh, my teacher told him, you know, my dad, well, he, okay, he has to practice an hour a day. That was like the gospel then, you know. So I had to practice an hour a day. And, you know, which really, obviously, was really good. I have students now, and I tell people, you know, your kid didn't, you know, you're just not really practicing much. They go, oh, he has soccer and all this bullshit. <laughs> I don't care what the hell you're telling me. <laughs> you know, no, you know, you're paying me a lot of money. Well, anyhow, that wasn't my case. So anyhow, to get back to your answer, no, your question. Uh, yeah, that's uh, so. I didn't really get a chance. You know, other people pick that, like Bruce Springsteen does that famous story where his father would say, you know, stop playing that blah blah guitar. Well, I didn't get a chance to rebel because you know I, I was I got lessons and <laughs> you know, and I liked it. And so and then you know I got I got my first electric guitar when I was like twelve. It was a K. It weighed as much as that couch. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> And there's a picture of me, really a bad one. Anyhow, so my biggest, my first performance outside of the house was at the Emeritol Club. Um, and uh, my uh, teacher was in the band, and they brought me down. I, was, I took like nine showers that day. I was so <laughs> nervous. And they brought me down to, uh, you know, to the Emeritol Club, and I played in front of all those adults. They were all decked out. People used to get dressed up then, you know, and they got all decked out, and I played my one song. And everybody went, oh, my goodness, he's so good. Well, you know, they were all my friends and my parents. What they really wanted to say was, okay, get the kid home now. We're going to drink. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need him here. So, but anyhow, that was my first time. And then somehow the... Somehow the nuns got wind of that. I don't know. I might have told them I played. And they had, okay, um, you'll be playing at lunch tomorrow. So I brought my... <laughs> <laughs> lunch at the school. And the, yeah, school. Yeah, and the school. tip That's hat awesome. went to the rectory, uh, <laughs> rebuild the rectory fund. <laughs> yeah. Frank got none of Special that money. Special assessment collection. We're going to need you to play Frank two more it. songs. We didn't collect enough. Listen, in the that church home. over on Main yeah. Street, Frank <laughs> bought that. We had built that shit with his guitar work. So anyhow, that was, you know, yeah, it was my thing. And so from, you know, from that, everything just was on a roll then. I, you know, I'm just like every other kid in the world, by the time I was 12, that was 1964, guess what happened yeah, then? The invasion, mm -hmm. man. And so every one of us, there were guitars, and we were all influenced by the same people and learned the same songs and whatnot. So that began the ball rolling. But you got to jump, too. And I've heard this story many times. You got to jump from the other people because you had started, you had your interest at five with Johnny Pagello. Yeah. And then the Sarge. Mm -hmm. uh, Frank's father, my grandfather, was a drill sergeant in mm -hmm. World War II, and he, yeah. he trained guys to go into combat uh, mm -hmm. prior to. Uh, uh, and, and anyway, so he was, and you know, very uh, organized, and I can, I can, yeah. you know, he's, that's the first time I'm hearing this, so I'm trying to like play it out in my head, mm -hmm. you know. And, <laughs> yeah, you know, and the Ameritalk Club for you know prodders out there beyond the Youngstown, Warren Greater area. That's a social club that was put together by Italian Americans. Yeah, the Ameritao, American Italian Club. Yeah, you know. and so you know they would go there and and have social time as a, as adults. And so mm -hmm. that's a I love that story. What's yeah. the guy's name again? Your teacher, Phil. Um, Phil Plaskin. Phil Plaskin. Yeah. Shout out, man. Yeah, to the Phil uh, Plaskin family. Great, great guy. And um, oh yeah, he, 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 I think he died. He died tragically. He was in a car cra crash and he was, was around for a long time. And um, but anyhow, yeah, he was he was a great guy. Really, he was really lucky that, that I had him in my life at such an early age. When did you form your first uh, ensemble? Your first band was it? You know, quickly after the Beatles. Well, it was right right about yeah. then. You know, I met these guys from. Uh, well, I met these guys from Howland. They had really nice equipment. <laughs> like 12, they had brand new cars and shit. Howland's yeah. the suburb of Warren again, Prodders. <laughs> this is a nice area. Brandon lives there in his mansion. <laughs> yeah. 
Anyhow, uh, so my first band was actually called the London Boys. Mm. Yeah. Nice. And that was a play towards the invasion? Mm, yeah. invasion? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ricky Vanelli was the bass player. And, uh, you know, his, Ricky Vanelli. Yeah. His mom was really cool. <laughs> Stage name or straight up name? <laughs> he his, sounds pretty London esque, <laughs> too. Vanelli. His, his mom uh, allowed him to. Uh, you know, have, have Playboy magazines. Whoa. Whoa. Ricky's mom was progressive. And he, oh, yeah. And he had, uh, he had long hair, what passed for long hair. Then, you know, it was outrageous. And beetle boots, you know. And he got to listen to his records backwards. Yeah. What are, be- <laughs> what are, be- that didn't come to like the late 60s. What are beetle boots? Beetle boots, they had a kind of a high heel. They were black leather boots, no uh, laces or anything like that. They were just, you know, black heeled boots that the Beatles wore. Yeah. Um, I wonder if those are coming back. Is that a hipster thing now? Oh, geez, I We're don't know. We're starting the trend. I hipsters don't, don't gravitate towards it. Someone else is going to bring back beetle boots. Uh, I don't know any hipsters yeah. right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was the first songs you played? Beatles songs? The first, well, yeah, the Beatles and um, the Beatles and the Stones, and there were factions in every band. Guys that would argue the Beatles were, they sucked. The Stones, <laughs> man. It was Beatles versus the Stones. <laughs> and some some people still have that argument now. What camp you, are you, you in? You can drive back. Well, I mean, there were different bands. You know, mm-hmm. there was nobody better. I, to this day, there's nobody better than anybody. It was different, you know? Yeah, yep. yep. Um, but, uh, I, I didn't, uh, have enough confidence to argue it one way or the other. And, uh, cause I didn't have Beatle boots. See, I, my level of commitment didn't reach that. You've got 57 years in the music business. Frank is a professional mm-hmm. musician. He's a working musician. Uh, maybe not from the time of 10, although from the time of 10, yeah, you were getting, you got some, how much money did you make at the uh, Ameritol, the first show? Oh, I didn't make anything. I was 12 years old. I just, oh. you know, they, they just yeah. brought me down there to, you know, as a dog. Warm up the show. crowd. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, this is my kid. He's not in jail yet. Look, you know. Do you remember any of the songs that you played from the London Boys? Oh, yeah. Well, we played, um, you uh, know, <laughs> you want to try one out? No, no. Frank brought his guitar. Uh, we, we, so this is the first time we're going to have some live entertainment, some live music. Because um, eventually, later on down the line, we're going to talk about a little project, uh, and we'll roll into that later. But the well, London Boys sounds kind of punk. Yeah. Well, yeah, we were London Boys for a while, <clears throat> and then I don't know what happened. We changed. Somebody changed the name to the What For. Oh, now this is a band I remember. I mean, I remember the name. I know uh, that, yeah. Yeah, the What For. There's a picture of us uh, at, at the uh, Monkey House right across the street. What is that thing called? Uh, the Monkey House? You know, right in the park there. The uh, um, the cabin? No, not the cabin. Yeah, I, can't, I can't come up with the name of it. The that. jail. <laughs> yeah, well, probably where we should There's have that. been. Uh, <laughs> no... Where does everybody play in the summertime, noon in the park? What's the name of it? Oh, at the amphitheater. The pavilion. Yeah, not the pavilion. Oh, oh, yes, the gazebo. <laughs> the gazebo. gazebo. I couldn't come up with yes. gazebo. In we were Trump, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the downtown courthouse here in Warren. Yeah, so there's a, there's a, there, there's a really funny, I, I can probably find this, I'll have to look for it, but there was a, an article in the paper. It said, uh, you know, it said, this week the What For will play. Man, at that's the gaz- high press, man. At the gazebo. And they will provide a contrast to the uh, uh, Harding Marching Band <laughs> 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 I played the week before. You what, know? So what guys? What did you guys play? Did you play some Stones? At oh yeah, we played Beatles, Stones, and various songs from that from that area. Uh, I, I don't remember all the tunes, but you know, typical stuff from that era, which was a lot of Beatles and Stones. Did you do any originals? No, no. Okay. No, that's Not then. It. That came later, right? Yeah, yeah. We didn't do any. No, nobody was doing originals then. Yeah. And when a lot did, of people think they are now, but they're not. Go ahead. When did you start? When did you remember the first song you wrote? When did you start writing? Uh, you know, because Frank's, uh, you know, 67 years, you're prolific. You did a lot of songs. A lot of songs you forgot. I'm going to talk about one later. I brought it up. You're like, oh, I forgot I made that song. Um, probably, you know, I, I had way too much. Well, maybe not too much, but I had a healthy respect for for uh, songwriting. So I didn't, you know, I, I wanted to serve a long apprenticeship that turns into decades. And uh, actually, the very, the most uh, that I written, and it was, mo- it was all the music for a play that was, pro- that was um, actually produced at Kent State. It was a, like a student project. And it was, 
I was I fell in love with this woman, and she was hired to write, you know, the book, and they needed someone to write the music, and so we were in love. You know, if, if she would have asked me to, you know, stand on my head, and you know, I would have done that. So I said, okay. You're so twenty at this time? No, I was more like twenty-eight or so. Okay, and. Uh, Prior to that, I, I didn't. I, I attempted to write, but I didn't really think I had anything to say, and so I wanted to <laughs> wait some time. And uh, it just doesn't stop a lot of people, and it should, you know. Anyhow, uh, so I wrote the music for. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote the music for this play, and it was really I'd never done anything like that, you know. And I thought, wow, it's amazing what happens when when you're in love, what you can do, and. Uh, but anyhow, so uh, that was really the first big burst, and um, we got reviewed, and the reviewer savaged the end. <laughs> Son of a bitch. <laughs> well, it was good. I had copies of the review made up. It was in the Akron Beacon Journal. I had copies of the review made up, and I signed it and gave them to my <laughs> to my friends, and I said, I couldn't have done it without your influence. <laughs> and, well, me, well, I only wrote lyrics to one of the songs in the play, and that got the best review. So that that nice. saved that saved me. Yeah, you know? but I mean, I didn't expect to you know to go to Broadway from you know from Kent. Well, you're at 28 at that point. You've now at that stage, you've already been in a half dozen bands, and you've been playing out. Like, walk us through that middle stage real quick. Well, your from 20s. The, uh, and okay, when music's was, changing, 60s, late 60s, 70s. Well, that didn't affect me as much because. I went to Youngstown State for two years, and uh, I was teaching guitar. And what, one, I'm sorry. What were you? Stu- did you have? Did were you studying music at Youngstown State? I was studying draft evasion. <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> to be honest, you know, uh, I really had no. I love the honesty. This is why. <laughs> that's why I was excited <laughs> about this. <laughs> I was um, excited about this one. Uh, and you know, I. Um, I really had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. That's when my friends say, he's 20 and he doesn't know. And then, you know, I go, it doesn't, you know, yeah. forget it. You 40 know. and I don't know. Who's right. got it all planned right. out at 20? Right. Anyhow, I had no idea. I was teaching guitar and um, a, a, a call came in one day to the music store. And uh, my friend Doug DePretto was working there. And, and uh, Doug, get well. He's got some struggles right now. Get well, Doug. But anyhow... He, uh, somebody called up and said, uh, we need a guitar player for this show band. And he was going, yeah, we got one right here. And I went, I was going like that, you know, no, shaking my head. And he goes, come on. So I got on the phone and they, uh, and they said we needed an audition. There was a, an agency in it at the time. Then, mind you, there was music everywhere. Everywhere, you know, if you could play a little bit, you could work and make money and stuff. And so this agency um, started up, and uh, well, Maureen McGovern, I don't know if you've ever oh, heard yeah, her sure. name. She yeah. was the— it's Phil's uh, first— uh, Right. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, she went on to have a really good career. And, uh, well, she's the queen of disaster songs. You know, got the, every time somebody died in a the movie, they had a hit record for her. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyhow, so um, they offered me a job. I went on the road. You know, they paid our expenses. And I thought, this is great. And so I have, that was, the guitar really was my ticket out of town. And I would always wanted to travel and whatnot. And so, and then when you're learning, like now, you play three hours a night or you'll go see, you know, there'll be a live music somewhere and there'll be 19 bands, each playing three songs. And, you know, man, we had to learn six hours. Of, I'm not, no kidding. Most wow. of the time it was five hours of material. Some places it was six. Holy shit. So, you know, it was like total immersion. And you were, they had to have some uh, stamina to you, too. Well, we were 20, you know, so we had all the stamina. (laughs) Yeah, true. (laughs) Plenty. But uh, so that was, uh, you know, like total immersion, you know. And, you know, we would play these shows and then afterwards go into our motel rooms and practice, hang out and, you know, have a good time. And, (laughs) and, you know, we were always talking about music. So that was a huge growth period, you know. So I did that from like 20 to 25. And uh, at that point, I... How, what was the radius of travel? Oh. 
Oh, we did. Warren McGovern was in these shows. With no, 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 no. She, she was just the the biggest act in the agency. Gotcha. And there was a whole there was like a half a dozen other bands in the agency. No, so, I was not with her. So were you playing show tunes? Like, was the agency booking mostly show tunes, or was it just not show tunes? But it, a show band is uh, was then. I don't know what you if it exists now. Well, like there were rock bands, which obviously you go to a club and you see a rock band. Right. Uh, and, uh, show bands appeared mostly in, uh, you know, restaurants, uh, oh, lo- locally. Al- clubs. Alberini's what, yep. used to have a room there. We, that was like a home base for all of these acts in that agency. And a show band, you know, people sit down, listen to you. So you have to be. Uh, and there was no competition. There wasn't 19 TVs right. showing the Little League tryouts from Encino, California. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you, you know, there was just uh, people on the, on the stage. So, you know, you learned all of these techniques on how to manipulate, excuse me, how to manipulate um, audiences. Keep people's attention and yeah. get them engaged. Right. And, if, and you, had to be, you, you looked around and you were cognizant of what was going on. And if somebody started talking over here, you were losing them. So, you know, it, you had to be... Now, the, the rules have changed because now you play a club and it's not uncommon to be competing with... TVs, you know, over here, wet t-shirt contest, a dwarf toss over here, you know, (laughs) you know, and it's not the same, you know, so, um, anyhow, that's, that's what a show band was, and we had four singers, I was, I didn't sing, I was, uh, in this particular, that first band, I played in, in a trio that backed up four singers, and, uh, you know, <laughs> did you sing at the time also? I sang, they, they would do two shows and we would do three sets. So we would do five sets total, two backing up the four singers. And they had red sport coats on. And this is the hippie oh, era. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're in a different, this is a different, your set is a different thing from that. No, we had to, you had to remain, remain a theme. It was typically, you know, there was you know, some jazz standards, some contemporary tunes. It was real education. You had to learn a whole bunch of different kind oh, of songs. That's cool. You, yeah, people danced during that set. But when the show came on, they sat down and watched it, you know. So that was a very good education, you know, for a couple of years and then I was in a couple other bands after that so anyhow the radius we played New York City um, East Tawas Michigan oh man it was a culture shock <laughs> we played New York City uh, at a place called Cody's and it was and uh, it was right around the corner from Rodney Dangerfield's club so uh, you know on our breaks uh, you know I'd, I'd walk over to Rodney Dangerfield's club and stand there and uh, you know the question is, did you get any respect at that club? No. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. Uh, and so, I, you know, and then from, so you're in the, you're in Mecca. You know, you're in the center of, uh, <laughs> of, of you know, music, right. art, New York City. Yeah, and then stand our up. next gig, gig was in East Tawas, Michigan. And at the time, the band that I was in, we played uh, some songs from Jesus Christ Superstar and uh, Fiddler on the Roof and tunes like that. And so we went to East Tawas, Michigan. Trust me, there was no internet then. So you could very well be in the smartest guy in East Tawas, the hippest guy, and never have heard of Jesus Christ Superstar. <laughs> so when we went there, and the, and they the thought guy said, you guys were aliens. Well, man. the guy, the, you know, the club owner goes, so what kind of material do you do? And we mentioned some things, and we went, you know, some things from Jesus Christ Superstar. And he goes, what? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ, superstar! <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, it's not really as bad as you think. Uh, you guys don't get out of East Tawas much, do you? And they didn't. You know, it was a different world. No internet. You know? Yeah. Well, that's what I was just about to say. It, it's we've been like 15 years now, so differently. Where yeah. If, if you didn't know a band's name, you couldn't, like, say, here, check this out real quick. This is kind of what I do. Or show a video. This is what we do. This is our demo and stuff. Yeah. But you had to sell your personality. You had to sell what you did. And then you ever played any, uh, back in the day, did you ever play any jams? People are like, is that an original? And you're like, wait a minute, this is a Beatles song. But, uh, <laughs> oh, let yeah. Let me look around. Can I get a free drinks? <laughs> you know, let me. Uh, yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, the, you know, there was nothing out there to, like. No. Fact checking in a sense. No, you can film yourself falling downstairs now and people in China can watch it in five <laughs> minutes. <laughs> you know? Well, I think that's a great point just about, and it's always interesting to talk about the diversification 
like your education on the road was so and I think people will Frank is very well known uh, in, in in here these parts here he's very well known as being a musician that is competently skilled in various and uh, and so it's interesting for me to hear this because I I've heard many of these stories but not to the context of this mm -hmm. so to know that you know, five hours. I can't imagine playing, you know, more than five minutes. And I mean, I, but I'm obviously not a musician, but, you know, five hours. And I'm thinking like various genres and different sets. And I think so to your library and acumen for music, you've probably forgot more than people now who go mm -hmm. into a four year degree or, you know, whatever it is. And they're learning a, I'm not knocking that, but a particular right. set and different things. You were out there, and to Brandon's point, there was no internet, so you weren't competing with things, and you, your skill set is that – if you go out and hear Frank locally or, or anywhere, but if you go out and hear Frank, uh, particularly when he played with a jazz quartet, I, I love – used to – you know, mm -hmm. that was the hip spot like 20 – not quite 20 years mm -hmm. ago, but to go hear Frank at the Avalon Gardens with a quartet – and he would engage, and you weren't competing because it was like in a back room. It was mm -hmm. a great place to see shows. I used to it bring was. chicks there all the time, like be, hmm. trying to impress them. This is my uncle. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and then they dumped him. This is my yeah. friend. <laughs> <laughs> and so, <laughs> but your acumen and, and your your repertoire is very large. It has a large breadth of work. Yeah. Well, one thing is my teacher Phil Plaskin. You know, he he taught me songs. That was the way he taught, you know. So it wasn't just exercises. Probably a lot of people w learn like that, but, you know, they were songs. And uh, and they were mostly from, you know, it was 1962, so they were from 62 and before, mm -hmm. you know. And most of those songs, and most of that era was my parents' era. Mm -hmm. And I loved their music anyhow, you know. So anyhow, yeah, I started with that. Then you move to popular music, rock and roll. Then you move to on and on and on. You move through all these things, and then... Uh, and then, you know, you play in these show bands and things are expected of you. And that's one thing that I'm really um, happy that I did. I put myself in situations where things were expected of me. Mm -hmm. Because if you just start your own band and never, and nobody ever tells you what to do, you don't have anybody. How, would you, how do you know where, where the line is? How do you know how high how you, you have to yourself. go? Right. right. And um, so that was, for me... And uh, that was very, that was very big. I, uh, you know, I, it was, here, learn these songs and have them by Friday. Yeah. And expectations know. and then meeting deadlines and things. Right. Like that. You're keeping yourself accountable. Right. Here's something too. You're doing five to six hours of music. Uh, you know, uh, one of our good friends, Tim, Tim Drummond, he would play for a few hours. He would need to know mm -hmm. different cover songs and stuff like that. But he's able to easily go on. I'm talking within minutes nowadays, print out music sheets. Mm hmm print out lyrics mm -hmm. yeah how did you like if they told you here's i need four hours this coming up yeah. this this friday I, did, were you listening to songs writing down the lyrics well like it, how did you where did you get this information from well, you've seen those things on on facebook you know misunderstood lyrics from years mm -hmm. ago because now you could go on, on lyrics.com and get lyrics to songs that haven't been written yet practically you know <laughs> but back then you know you listened to records and uh, <laughs> Duplicate it the best you can? Well, you listen, and, and, and what is he saying here? Like, Lua, <laughs> Lua, Lua. Oh, baby, we, got, we don't know, have any idea what the hell that guy's talking about. <laughs> right. They didn't know what they were talking about. But, you know, it, it, it was banned, you know, because it was, it was full of sexual innuendo. It wasn't. You know, but, you know, you know, when you don't know what the person's saying, you can attribute anything to that song. <laughs> so anyhow, and th that's what we did. Well, is it, well, we think he's saying this, so that's what we're going to say, you know. And then, you know, as far as learning how to play, you pick the needle up and you place it on, 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 on that record and you listen to it and you go, oh, man, how did he do that? How did he do that? Oh, the death. It was painstaking. Now... You know, within it, minutes, you can get the whole, like I said, yeah. you, get, you get the lyrics in front of your face. You well, get not the only that, sheet music you can get somebody to teach you that song a lot of times, too. Yo, There's that's like what 50 dudes yeah. on there, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, YouTube video. Yeah. Here's how you play. Right. Here's yeah. here's the lick from that song. Yeah. yeah. So you know, kids are way better than we were because they're exposed. I mean, now you can see, you know, a four-year-old kid playing all the parts from Bohemian Rhapsody simultaneously on a kazoo. Right. <laughs> you know, well, you know, so yeah, that, back then, and it was, oh man, somebody learned that Hendrix lick. How do you do that? 
You know, I remember one particular, at the beginning of Wait Until Tomorrow, which was on Axis Bold as Love. My friend learned that, and he showed me, and it was gold, man. <laughs> it was gold. But um, anyhow, that's that's how we learned. It was it was you know it wasn't there was no, there was no one even even tab now, which is not music, but it just shows you the positions on the guitar. That's how I started to learn. Mm-hmm. It was tab. I don't I don't you know yeah. I read music, and I, the, I, the, 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 I I downshift just for a second because I I'm, I want to just go back to that story in New York City. You're playing, uh, and then going to see Rodney Dangerfield out. Mm. Uh, and Frank, obviously, so I, it's a two part. There's two questions to this because obviously we're laughing here and it's in this is typical of Frank. Like mm-hmm. you ever think about we're actually talking about stand up before we started the show. Mm-hmm. You ever think about doing stand up? Because, <laughs> you know, uh, here's the deal. You know, being I, I obviously have an absurdist view of the world. Stand up is very hard. You know, it's it's easy when mom and dad and Aunt Sally are in the audience, <laughs> right? Yeah. But when they don't show up and it's some guy with a you know a, a neck tattoo and a live Chihuahua earring, you know, you better make him laugh. <laughs> well, you know, all art's great to your family and friends. <laughs> yeah, Frank, Frank told me this a while ago. You know, and I, we were talking about somebody else, I think, and probably myself as well. But uh, go out and get your ass kicked. Like you got to go out and take your and, and, you know, Frank's instrument is the axe, you know, is, is his guitar. Go out and take your lumps and get yep. out of, you know, the, your comfort zone of the people who well, obviously love you and they want you to. Do, so they're going to, you know, they have an affinity for you. They, te- they tell you, oh, it's courtesy. great. You need it. You're right. Well, I'll right. tell you, when I, going back to uh, Destiny was the name of the organization that I played in that first show band with. And they had a musical director that, you know, that arranged for all of the bands that they had. And his name was Orly Vitello. All and, these guys are Italian. Every, oh, you yeah. notice all these people in there? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Vitello, Pagello, <laughs> Vigili. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Anyhow, Orlando Vitello. <laughs> banana, uh, he, banana, 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 uh, banana, taught, Italian. He taught uh, at Youngstown State. And uh, he was really a smart guy. And what, right before we left town for the first time, he took me aside and said, uh, you're pretty good. <laughs> Thank you, you know. And uh, he says, but you know what? When you get out of town... Mom and dad aren't going to be there cheering, and all the parents from this band aren't going to be there cheering you on. And there's going to be strangers in the audience, and you're going to have to earn there. So oh, yeah. you'd better, you got to practice. And so every town that I went to, the first thing I did after we unloaded, got our motel rooms, I would go to a music store and take a lesson. I, I did that all over the country. No just, just one lesson, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, that is awesome. You probably met a lot of Italian uh, people <laughs> along your way to learn you more music. Well, the thing about traveling <laughs> Not in Wabash, yeah. in Michigan. Or wherever Excuse me, sir. What, was. you're Slovakian? No. Nope. <laughs> you, gotta... you travel across the country, you're going to find out that there's, this is a big country. Yeah. You won't recognize it as it's America, many, the America that you know. You know. Yeah. You, you know, um, I don't have a plethora of music background like you do, but um, you were in, I, you were I in was band, in a band. Though, yeah, yeah, I was in a band in player. high school and went, went on to my early twenties. We're in a band, did um, mostly covers, yeah. trying to get chicks. He yeah, just, you know, to just trying to get chicks, <laughs> well, trying that's... to get free beer and stuff like that. <laughs> okay. But uh, one of the golden There's rules no pay tonight. You're that, just drinking for free. <laughs> one of the golden rules, and you would just see it is. I was always taught, and maybe you could speak about your years of probably doing this, is whether there's 5,000 people or there's five people, you give it all you got and you put the best show on that you have. Yeah. You don't be one of those people that say, there's only five people out here, man. We're just going to, we're just going to just play half ass. Because that's free. You know, (laughs) here's the thing. Every opportunity that I had on stage was an opportunity to make myself better. Mm-hmm. So if there was only five people out there, we would look at each other and say, now is the time to maybe try a couple different things. You yeah, know what I mean? Nice. Not say, let's just get the hell out of here. You know, what, what do you think about that? Is, was that always your philosophy too? No. Okay. Uh, <laughs> there was five people. Well, I was you, getting the hell out. You, uh, when I first started doing solo stuff, uh, I was working for a restaurant chain. In in uh, Cleveland, it was Boar's Head's Dry Dock. They were all this under the same umbrella. Uh, Boar's Head Dry Dock, Mountain Jacks, and I can't remember the other. Maybe that was the only ones. But I would get six week contracts, five nights a week, at one. And then uh, you living in Kent at the time. Yes. Yeah. And 
which was great because there were tons of music. I, I would work six weeks, take, make enough money, take a couple weeks off, and I'd play with a whole bunch of different people, you know. Anyhow, so I, um, what was I going to say? Oh, it, 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 to your point, um, yeah, Monday night, you know, Monday night there'd be, you know, three used car salesmen there, <laughs> you know, drinking, trying to hit on the cocktail waitress. That's who I'm playing to. You know, uh, Tuesday night, kind of the same thing. And it would work up to the week. And during the week, Wednesday night, you might have 10 secretaries there because it's hump day and just like that. But <clears throat> most of the time, uh, yeah, and that's where you learned how to uh, get an audience on your side. And still, at this point, there weren't TVs everywhere. It was live music, five nights a week. Imagine that, you know. In any event... Um, one particular time, you might get a kick out of this, I was playing and there was one guy there. And I would play a song and when I get... You're that, soloing at the time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd play a song and he would applaud. I went, okay, cool, there's one guy here who's into my thing. I don't feel as lonely as I did, you know. So I'd do another tune and, uh, <laughs> and he would applaud very enthusiastically, you know. I just went on a couple times and then I took a break. And I went up to him and I said, oh, thanks, man. It's really nice having you here to, to play to, you know. And he looks at me and he goes like this. He was deaf. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't hear a note that I played. He just seen me stop singing so he knew the song was done. And uh, I thought to myself, wow, so this is all in my head. <laughs> you know, <laughs> everything exists in my own head. And... Uh, so that's uh, anyhow. That was one. Of, that's actually happened to me twice. <laughs> <laughs> Same guy. <laughs> no, different guy. <laughs> different guy. But anyhow, yes. And even yeah, like now, the same I, guy. I, I would rather play to three people listening to me than a hundred people who are screaming over me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So and and in clubs, you get that now, especially now because, like I said, the the. the uh, Techniques you learned on how to manipulate an audience mm -hmm. are out the door now because you're competing with three people watching four playoff games. You know, I want to go back in time one last time before yeah. we move into the future. Sure. We're back to this Rodney Dangerfield. You're in New York City. You're mm -hmm. checking him out. And that's, we always talk about that comedian thing. But so our family's from New York. Our, Frank's uh, father's from Brooklyn. Uh, did they ever, did any of the family ever come out while you were there to see the shows? And you got any cool stories? Uncle Ernie ever get into some, like, anything ever? No, um, Johnny Pagello came out. <laughs> okay, Johnny Pagello, that's Sonny's? His brother. Okay, yes. Yeah. Okay. So it's my father's old, um... First cousin. No, it's his, it, or his his sister. Nep it, nephew. Right, yeah. right. Um, but anyhow, yeah, he... Came out for his 40th birthday. We were playing at a place called Cody's. It was on East 62nd Street. <laughs> how, how do you remember that, man? That's awesome. <laughs> and Is I, Cody still around? Oh, probably Check not. that out, New Yorkers. <laughs> probably not. Cody's on, I wonder what's on East 66th now. Um, uh, so <laughs> it, was, it was like an after, uh, we, we did like not. An after hour club. Yeah, I was playing with a band called Jerry Hammond and the Entertainers featuring Gail Short. Were four people in the band. <laughs> <laughs> little ego there. Oh, maybe they Jerry wanted. was a criminal, <laughs> and uh, I mean, he picked up a U-Haul trailer in you know East Tawas, Michigan, and that was it. Never dropped it off. <laughs> and uh, so you're playing as the E66, and Johnny Pagello walks in unannounced, or do you no, know he's going to be there? I I don't remember if I knew he was going to be there, but he came with his wife uh, Anne and another couple who I don't remember who they were. But, you know, that was his 40th birthday, and that was 1973, so I can always tell how old he is based upon that. He turned 40 in 1973. So anyhow, the other uh, aunts and uncles, no, but I did stay with my grandmother. She lived on East 7th Street, 383 East 7th Street in Brooklyn. I stayed with them, and, uh, God, it was so much fun you know, to be around them as an adult that's awesome. You know, and, uh, you know, traveling around the country and I get to see, you know, I get to stay with them. They were really a lot of fun at that point. And then you went East Coast playing and traveling and doing things and mostly based out of Kent. And at some point, walk me to that stage. No, you... this was prior to Kent. Um, from 70. Well, I'm, I'm encapsulating now. Oh, okay. I'm encapsulating. So we moved back out into the now. Oh, Kent, we're going back to Kent? Well, no, 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 no. So we did okay. Kent. We did the New York thing. We did. 
and at some point in your 30s, mm -hmm. you moved to Las Vegas. I and was, that's the yeah. next, this is and for my chapter, because mm -hmm. and I'm trying to think how old I was when you moved. Frank always was like, this is, but you know, so uh, mm -hmm. I, you know, spent a lot of time with my grandparents and uh, around them and my parents and, uh, but Frank was always out of town. The rest of the family was mostly in town. Frank was in Kent and we would, I would see him, you know, sporadically, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But, and then he moved to Las Vegas, and that was like a big. Or did you move somewhere else first? Well, what happened was I was. And what? Give us a time. Give us a chronology here. You're uh, 32. 30. How old are you? 32. Time? Uh, something like that. This is the 80s now. Yeah, early, early 80s. 80s. Yeah, I had a band. I was in Kent. I had a band. Uh, the main I, squeeze? No, yeah, it was after that. I had a, a couple of guys that I played with, really, and we weren't making any money. And what happened was, this was, you know, disco had already happened, yeah, okay. which wiped out a lot of live music. Kent still had some, but, you know, there was like, you know, like Devo, and <clears throat> there's like, you know, those kinds of bands came in. <laughs> yeah, they were great and everything, but oh, yeah. it was a different thing. What we were doing, you know, we, we, we had outlived our usefulness. You weren't putting red hats on and jumpsuits. Uh, right. Yeah. And, and and there weren't as many venues and uh, and my so my friends we we played a show they used to play a place in Ravenna called the Carousel Dinner Theater and every once in a while we'd luck out and get a show there and be, play in the pit there and so uh, my friends got a job playing with this show uh, called Bottoms Up and um, they told me one day hey um we're going to uh, you know they they hired us so we're going to uh, uh, New Orleans with them. We're going to be with them. They they traveled, and so that was the end of that. And they said, you know, Dan and Gotti said, uh, hey man, if it, you know if a guitar chair opens up, we'll we'll give you a call. And I thought, okay, cool. I never thought that would happen. And uh, so um, a couple of years later, I had fallen in love and written that play, and I was still with that woman. And she just graduated from college, and we were sitting there going, what do we do now? Because, you know, we're so much in love, we could do anything, you know. And my friend called up. Now, this is, this is important to know. I don't know if this could happen now. But my friend called up and said, he was a bass player, and he said, I'm leaving this show, and um, so, you, so buy a bass, and you could be <laughs> Now, I didn't play the bass, and the bass and guitar are similar, right. but they're totally different. different. Yeah, yeah, completely different instruments. And I did not play the bass. I didn't own a bass at that point. And I said, okay. <laughs> I was like Pete Davidson. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so, so I bought a bass and I, I really practiced and I bought a car and uh, like that, you know, and I told my girlfriend, she said, okay, you know, and so we packed up and uh, our first job was in Houston. So we left in February. It was cold and gray and edgy and shit, you know. And we and we drove to Houston and we played. Springtime in Houston is really nice, and uh, so we played a, a show at some Red House Dinner Theater there. And uh, it, I was being exposed to a completely different world. And then from there we went to Las Vegas, where we stayed for about a year. And from there, we went to Reno another year, then to Tahoe, and they laid me off in Tahoe, and that's how I ended up staying there, because, you know, they, they, they you know. But anyhow, from there, I went, you know, Tahoe, Reno, San Francisco, Francisco. Tahoe. Yeah. Well, I, I didn't know where I was most of the time. Um, but it was, um, anyhow, that's uh, how I ended up out there. Traveling with, with and playing. Uh, yeah. most nights a week, six nights a week, five nights a week, whatever, well, you different play, extensions for the show time and then oh, it was, a break? It was, well, the show was, we played two hour shows, hour and 15 minute shows. And then there would be four shows on the bill. And the other two shows would be uh, Jay Leno, uh, either comedians or uh, you know, Dennis Miller and uh, Tower of Power, B.B. King, on and on and on. So I got to meet all these people and watch them. You know, if I wanted to watch them five nights a week, I could. You know, they, they would do two weeks. We would be there for a, a year. And so every two weeks, that thing would change. And most of the acts were most of the acts were, were great. You know, I, I, I could see it and, you know... I, Got to meet these people a little bit, you know, hang out with them. You know, they were. That's awesome. Yeah. 
Any cool stories? Everybody likes to hear the cool. Who's who is super cool? Oh, BB King. Um, my friend was a sound man at uh, at Harris, and he said, "Hey, Frank, BB um, King's coming in for a sound check today. You want to you want to hang around and watch it?" I went, "Hell yeah, man! Who <laughs> <You> wouldn't?" <laughs> and so they had a room in the back of Harris with a whole bunch of equipment in it, and uh, he he just brought his guitar, Lucille. And, uh, you know, which I, I always get a kick out of gearheads when they start talking about equipment. I go, B.B. <laughs> King didn't bring an amp, okay? He used whatever was laying around. <laughs> you know. Well, he liked super reverbs, and so we went in the, in the back room and got a super reverb, you know, brought it back, and uh, he hooked up the amp, and I sat in the front row, and I'm waiting to hear, uh, I'm waiting for B.B. King sound check, and I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to sing like, Half hour, 45 minutes of B.B. King playing tunes and whatnot. I was really excited, you know, starstruck, you know. And you know, little by little, you know, the, the, the band filters in. And then here comes B.B. King. He just walks in and he's got his guitar. And uh, he says hi to me because I was one of the few people there. And I went, yeah, hi, man. <laughs> you know? and, uh, and you call him Mr. King or B.B.? No, nah, I, just, I just said hi. What's I up, B.B.? I, I don't remember what I said. <laughs> yeah, because, like, we're dudes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, anyhow, I, I was sitting there, and B.B. King plugs into this amp. You know, he turns the amp on. You know, he plugs into this amp, and he plays a couple of notes and, you know, just a couple of B.B. King licks. I'm going, oh, this is going to be great, you know. And uh, twists a couple of knobs, and then he plays a couple of notes, and he turns around, you know, twists the knob, and then he turns the amp off, unplugs his guitar, and leaves. <laughs> <laughs> there was not a lot, you know, no, man, it's in my fingers, okay? <laughs> there, ain't, there ain't no knob where you can do this kind of stuff, you know? And that was it. And, uh, you know, the rest of the guys were there, but I wasn't interested in going on their sound check. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but later on, in fact, Uncle Dave, your Uncle Dave, <clears throat> excuse me, I um, bought B.B. King's, I think it was his 50th anniversary album. I went out and bought it at a record store, and I brought it in, and I asked him to sign it. And he goes, oh, yeah, sure. And he, and he said, what do you want me to put on there? And I said, happy birthday, Dave. And uh, it might have been Merry Christmas. I think it was Happy Birthday, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> and he puts Happy Birthday, Dave, B.B. King. Dave, he still got it. That's yeah. awesome, man. <laughs> I did not know that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so he was, yeah, completely without airs. I mean, this guy was, he was a very real person. And that, that comes across just on, on stage, you know. Yeah. yeah it, 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 that's just who he is. Yeah, just, you're so, not faking that shit. Yeah, there's nothing to fake at this point, right. man. You're B.B. King. Right. You know, who were you? <laughs> well, he knew he was bad on his on his instrument, too. Well, you know? Yeah, he's, he he's, just, you know. You pay your dues, you know, the real people. It's not ass shaking and, uh, you know, gyrating on this. That's what today is, which I think is with an interesting, yeah. you know, dichotomy. He's just there. He brings one thing. <laughs> He's got his instrument. That's his tool. Yeah. But the real magic is what he what right. he is. You know, right. What he brings. Nobody's gonna go see BB King and say, God, his guitar didn't sound that good. <laughs> no, it sounded pretty good. <laughs> I want a uh, uh, reverb uh, amp and and all these. You know, we we're talking. We had Eric Ryan on last show, and we we're talking about riders, like off yeah. off air. We we're talking about riders and stuff, and like, you know, I need to have my Steinway there. I need to have four rooms with this and yeah. that, and you know. And this guy just shows up with a guitar. That's a cool story. So then at some point, you um, move home, which was like, you know, for me as a kid, I mean, I, and I'm in my, well, actually, we moved home kind of at the same point, although yeah, you were, I was I only gone. For, you graduated you know, from college not long after I came here. Yeah. Yes. Right. Um, yeah. And, and so I was so excited. And that was a cool you know, mm -hmm. the, you know, it's, it's corny, yeah. but the sun return, and, you know, and, and then, yeah. then I got to, as an adult, start to really appreciate what I had. Mm. It's funny when my uncle came home from Vegas or, you know, from out West, uh, I would, you know, we would go and obviously it was a, you know, big, how do you do? And it was fun. And it was a lot of, a lot of times around holidays. And at one point I can remember you coming home and I was in high school and one of my best friends at the time and still to this day is my buddy Mark Walton, uh, Mike Cornicelli's mm -hmm. grandson. And, and anyways, and so I said, man, my, hey, my uncle's home. He was dropping me off at grandma's after. I said, you know, 
let's instead of you know fucking off after school today my uncle's coming home man let's go and see and you know and i was you know i kind of <laughs> i was like talking you up man I go, he could play anything man by ear he's so amazing and so we went into the basement and you probably don't even remember this and i was just like hey man what do you and mark was a uh, you know, we were all Zeppelin fans and, and Clapton and, and we were just naming tunes and you were just ripping them and playing them. And it was so, I felt cool. And then that's a couple years later, you know, probably four or five, six years later, I'm getting home from college and you're moving home from out West and it was super cool. And it was still kind of, you talk about a music scene that you experienced, you know, four years ago. For me, this was 20 years ago not even probably a, a blip on the radar in comparison to where, you know, mm -hmm. you were at. But for me, that was my music right. heyday. And we were, you know, going down to the local bars and the clubs and seeing live music. And you could see Frank several nights a week along with a host of others. And I, I talked about Avalon Gardens. And, uh, you know, that was a, just a cool thing, man. And that was a cool scene. And then at some point, you take your original stuff and make an album. I know I'm flashing forward like super fast, but I mm. uh, want to keep us on pace to some extent because that, that guitar behind you is gleaming at mm. me. Uh, but you move home and you make In a Mellow Tone. Mm -hmm. What was that experience like? I, I was fortunate enough to come and watch a little bit of that, you know. Well, that had only uh, one original song on it, and uh, that was an instrumental and um, the rest the of de Pascual. <laughs> yeah, which I can't even play anymore. I have to, I don't have to practice. <laughs> um, but um, that was, you know, my real talent is hiring people that are better than me. That's you taught me this skill. <laughs> yeah, by the way. yeah, you got to surround yourself with it, yeah. killers. I mean, okay, you know, yeah. if you're the best person in the band, you're in the wrong yeah. band. Man. <laughs> you know, and. and uh, so I had my Tim Harker, Tim Harker, and and Will, Wilbur Krebs. Wilbur Krebs, yeah. and uh, Tim is Tim is still around. He's, and, and I run into him once in a while. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 I'll see him in like YSU or you know on Youngstown or whatever. And his son, his son's band is great too. Who's his son's band? Uh, Ghost Soul Trio was one of them. What? They Shout were, out they Ghost were, Soul Trio. They were just that, 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 see it. that big Youngstown. Oh yeah, music yeah. Fest the, last yeah, weekend. the party on the square thing. Yeah, Ghost Soul. Yeah. So I, I told Tim, well, I've lived long enough that I wouldn't be good enough to be in your son's band. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, I don't know if that's true necessarily. But They're good. I remember going to, what's Talanka's place called out in? Uh, oh, Toontown. Toontown. Which is where that was recorded. Yeah. Super cool place. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually ended up coaching Mike Talanka's oh. nephew, Pete, <laughs> in soccer years later. But that's a cool place. And I, I that was the first time I had ever experienced that, like mm -hmm. going out and seeing like real yeah, artists like, putting it down. It was fucking cool. That was a real place. Yeah. But anyhow, so that was, we did that in an afternoon. Yeah. And uh, actually went back and uh, tweaked it a little bit a couple times. But I really, it was done in an afternoon. And uh, oh, it was really nice. Now I listen to it and I go, oh man, I would still be tweaking. Mm, you yeah, know. that's everybody. <laughs> 13 yeah. years later. <laughs> All art is abandoned. It's never finished. <laughs> yeah. That's a great CD. I'm not saying that. I'm not, you know, you know, I'm not saying that because he's my uncle. I, that, I, it was, you put it, you know, best. It's, and the title is, says it all, in a mellow tone. Mm -hmm. Frank would say, you'd put this on and take a nap to it. Mm -hmm. And you would sit, it's, it's awesome. I love it. That, you introduced me to that song, mm -hmm. in a mellow tone. You also introduced me to so many other pieces of music that I never would have got to experience. You know, we've got to see uh, Steely Dan together. I never would have been a Steely, you know, I, I don't know if I never would have, but you know, that yeah. your appreciation kind of wore off on me a little bit, uh, not a little bit, but a lot. Um, and you have, uh, you have some other music, original pieces that you are creating now. Mm -hmm. So how long ago, In a Melatonin was 2000. Three or Two? something okay, like that. Okay, yeah. yeah. Something like that, yeah. And so now this is 16 years later. Yeah. And you've been working on some stuff, mm -hmm. and you are recording again, mm -hmm. which I'm super pumped. Yeah, uh, it's it's a lot of fun. Whether or not anybody likes this stuff, it, it doesn't matter because You'll like it's, it, yeah. it's just a it, 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 just a, uh, the process of creating process, is yeah. fun, yeah. you know. And you put it out there and see what happens. So, <clears throat> yeah, it's... 
67 years in the making. I've never, I haven't recorded any original stuff. I haven't, so, but I think that I've been trying to hone my writing skills and, uh, you know, getting the right vodka. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And I think I found that it's, it's at a convenience store. Uh, anyhow, yeah, so that's what I'm doing now. I'm having a fun time doing that. And, of course, you know, it's easy to, it's easy to do it now, you know, everybody. Much think, simpler process. Yeah, yeah, my grandmother has a box set coming out. So every, <laughs> it's, uh, it's so easy to record now, you know. Right. And I, I was thinking, you know, recently that when, you know, when we were young, you know, if, if, if somebody could finance a, the making of a 45. Yeah. You know, it was expensive because you couldn't do that at home. You had to go to a Press recording it. studio. Right, right. And you went to the recording studio and then you, you know, and you got your thing. And, you know, the first thing is your grandmother buys 10. And uh, then, you know, that there's, you know, so everybody else, a couple of people buy them, but you're there, you're there. They, then they go into somebody's closet and, you know, your progeny discovers that box like long after you're dead they sell it and uh, you become very i got a couple boxes of waxing gibbous in my basement somewhere <laughs> you become very big in germany and you self-distributed too which was you know the in a melatonin i was telling brandon earlier like, yeah there's a lot of those out there you had a nice run because you were playing live too and and, and doing it yeah, i made a thousand uh copies and I, I sold quite a few of them yeah just out of the back of my car and uh yeah, and that's the way I'm going to do this, you know, sell it, this next one, too. I mean, everybody I know that's streaming, they go, oh, we got 40 million hits. We made $12, you know. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you that, too, actually, in my notes. You know, talking about recording a CD and, and you know, Mike Talenka Studio is like a legit big place. Yeah. There was, you know, everyone was playing at the same time. Um, this you can do in a, you know, I mean, we're, where do you have this radio show, for lack of a better term, yeah. you know, that terminology, broadcast? But, you know, it's in a, we're in like a little room here. Like yeah. The, the equipment's not a, you know. We could do it in your car. We could, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Well, maybe not in the car, but yeah. in, in my basement. Right. Okay. Or in, you know, whatever. So it's the same kind of thing with different studios and stuff. Now it's a smaller space and you can control it a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. Same you can control with the distribution end of things. Are you thinking about, you know, also doing like electronic? Like, are we going to, these new, these this new stuff you're working on iTunes, like you're going to try to get it out into that space as well. YouTube wouldn't take anything to upload them and just yeah. let them live and breathe. Yeah. You know. Well, you know. I don't I, know. I'm just, yeah. The next thing is just completing just the project. Just getting Yeah. How many pieces, how many, um, how many, how many albums or how many uh, songs do you think will go on the album? Well, I don't know. I've got about eight done now. And uh, I, I think I'm just going to... Uh, uh, what I want to do is, um, I just have them individually, you know, right now. So what I want to do is put them all in one thing, drive around, listen to them, right. see if any of them offend me. Marinate. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, see, if, you know, get get an order together. Yeah, because who, nobody does, or I guess people do, but and that's not the thing to do now. You release one here and, you know, uh, it, it's streaming. But, you know, to make a whole CD, who does that anymore? I don't know. Katy Perry, but, you know. Well, I like that you're making an album. You're making a, a, a something that right. has a flow to it, and there's a, you know, that's the one thing I think we, you know, this is uh, obviously, this is a cliched thought now. It, it's been true for a long time. There's not a lot of people that are putting an album together. Right. You know, or you put it on and you, it's like, here's your single and here's a bunch of shit, or they might mm -hmm. not even put the bunch of shit. It's just, here's the single. Yeah. Like, bang it. And, you know. Right. So I mean that's that's the modern way of doing it. There's nothing wrong with that. We live, live in a different world now. But um, what's the journey we're going on? In can I say the title? We talked about it. Oh, it's called Roll On. Yeah. In one of the songs on on the CD is called Roll On, and uh, it, I've I've recorded <laughs> I recorded this one three or four times, a couple different studios, and. Uh, you know, I think I'm happy with this one till the next studio. <laughs> <laughs> Will we hear this song at the Two Ticks and the Dog studio? Yeah, why not? Are we too long now, you think? No, no, not at all. I think hopefully we, we've we've built it up. I'm mm -hmm. eagerly awaiting. I ho I had hoped you would just pick up and play maybe a couple songs, mm -hmm. but is that the song we're going to hear? Well, let me... Uh 
we'll adjust here too. Okay. Because uh, you, you can go ahead and Frank's going to get himself situated. Uh, you know, I want to preface again the importance. And I feel bad because Brandon, we went a little long. Uh, Brandon had to step out. He had another appointment. And, uh, yeah. You know, I pick up that guitar and I play it, and it pisses me off. <laughs> you take that with you, okay? <laughs> I got a guitar in my studio. I, you know, I noodle around a little bit. And I go, I don't know, Frank, because he bought his one of his guitars. I said, I don't know. I had this one out to sound check it. So, ah, it's, you know, it doesn't sound that great. The action's a little high. He picks it up, and it sounds like a fucking Stradivarius. What's this song called? I'll start off with the uh, roll on. This is kind of a long song. But, you know, when you're writing your own songs and recording your own songs. Do you want me to adjust that with a boom out so you have more space? I don't know. I think, I think I'm good. Yeah, cool. You know. One thing about it, you know, you're in control of, uh, you know, uh, editing. If you think it's not long enough. <laughs> Too long. So anyhow, uh, yeah, here's the song that I'm talking about. <laughs> Kicked it at a hundred and one. Everyone agrees she had a good run, but I ain't done. I ain't done. I ain't done. Yeah, I ain't done. Ray Charles sang a sweet mean tune. Everybody knows it went too soon. I ain't done. Sweet love, I ain't done ridiculing hate. I ain't done showing up early, and I ain't done strutting in real late. And I ain't done acting self righteous. And I ain't done begging for a second chance. I ain't done praying for redemption And I ain't done with a sinful dance My best friend died at 45 They did all they could to keep him alive But I ain't done I ain't done I ain't done Taking a deep breath I ain't done Speaking out of turn I ain't done Flying off the handle And I ain't done Doing a slow even burn time in the world to play how much there is they never say I ain't done 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 being a big man I ain't done acting a petulant child I ain't done being responsible I ain't done being a little bit wild When I go throw my dust to the sky Some fall down in somebody's eye I ain't done, I ain't done I ain't done, I ain't done I ain't done Being a genius I ain't done being dumb as a rock. I 
I ain't done Being as graceful as a ballerina And I ain't done tripping over my feet when I walk When I go throw my dust to the sky Some fall down in somebody's eye the blind man in the thing but I did close my eyes I'm not the deaf man that was fucking awesome man that sounded I've heard this song this that maybe is only the second time it's I loved it the first time I love it even more now I can't wait to have this well good in my iPod sh- I don't even have an iPod shuffle I'll just plug it in I want to, we gotta put that on the internet man that's gotta be we gotta have I mean, electronic distribution. These songs are too that uh, your writing has gotten. Uh, not that it hasn't been before. I talked about a song earlier. I, I so I'm so blessed because I got to ask my. And we've worked together on a couple, a bunch of projects. But I got to ask making this movie. I moved back from school, and my uncle was back from music, and I asked him to write this song. And it was. I, we talked about the because I forgot about it, and it was Night Falls. <laughs> And I think about, I think we talked about this back then yeah. when I heard this song roll on for the, for the first time. Your lyrics are so good, man. And I'm a, I'm a fucking lyric nerd, man. I love it, man. Oh, I fucking love uh, it. You know, well, one thing I have to say is, uh, you know, I, I threw away a whole bunch of stuff that I wrote when I was in my 20s. Because, number one, I didn't really think I had anything to say. And to my credit... Uh, no, I was being honest then, you know, and it sounded like some guy writing stuff. So once I eliminated, you know, uh, well, just let it flow, you know, and base things on life, you know, and uh, it, 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 songs sound a little bit better now, you know, they sound a little more authentic, you know. Well, you know what you are, what you want to say, and you know better how to say it yeah i i i went to hear my friend a couple of my friends play at this hotel i was in college we went to toledo and there was a wedding party afterwards Mm -hmm. and you know fancied myself a bit of a writer frank (laughs) (laughs) still do still trying to be a writer yeah and so i of course uh at, at the hotel afterwards there was um my friends played and then it, we were in the bar of the hotel. And afterwards, the people came from a wedding reception. And it was the bride and groom's parents. And they were, you know, very nice. very. And the mother, one of the mothers, the bride's mother maybe, was mm-hmm. divorced. Mm-hmm. And she was 51. Mm. And I was in a very, you know, very attract. You know, I was mm-hmm. 21 yeah. at the time, 22. And... You know, I was. Are you trying to seduce me? I, I, <laughs> I was trying to strut my shit a little bit and mm-hmm. spread my wings. And anyways, I struck up some conversations, and she was a very nice woman. Uh, and she said, "Well, what are you know? What do you? What's your thing?" And I said, "I'm getting ready to graduate, and you know, blah blah blah." And she goes, "Well, what are you studying?" And, and I said, "I'm you know, film student, and but my minor is creative writing. I really you know." And she said. How old are you? And I said, you know, I was, you know, trying to be cool. I said, twenty, you know, twenty-two. But you know, mm-hmm. I, I knew where she was going. I said, but I'm a, wor-, you know, I don't know what I said, like fucking worldly twenty-two. Yeah. <laughs> fucking, how do you even been out of, you know? Yeah. And, and she goes, um, what are you gonna write about? <laughs> Yeah. And so, you know, part of it is the confidence. You have to, you know, not that there's not writers that are 22 and can't yeah. imagine stuff or that can write, you know, authentically right. about whatever their experience is at that particular time. Yeah. Some people are more precocious than others. Uh-huh. But, uh, man, I feel like we should uncork like a fine <laughs> bottle of wine and listen to. Can we play another one? 
Do you have, yeah. do you bring more? Yeah, sure. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be from the album. You play whatever you want. Let's just listen a little bit because this is a first time for our prodders out there. Um, maybe you can take us out with the song because I'm trying to oh, do yeah. the time. I think we're about, uh, uh, we could maybe do a couple more. I mean, we're an hour. Fuck right. it. We can do whatever we want. I do have to get on a, yeah, yeah. a meeting afterwards, but then let's play a couple more. Let's All see. right. Uh, you know, I should say that uh, is there's some you know electric guitar and more funk type stuff on this album too. So it's not all acoustic guitar. These are like acoustic versions of this stuff. But anyhow, so here's one I wrote and I played for a friend of mine and he didn't like it. So I want to do it right now for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and wherever you are, who is it? You, who's your friend? Oh, I don't. No, we don't want to say. Yeah. I don't want to embarrass him. He didn't like it. Yeah, well, I don't know if he didn't like it. He just wasn't enthused about it. Did you it. make any, um, did you adjust any pieces, parts of it, you know, to? No, no. I, I just called up and had his credit card canceled. <laughs> <laughs> Does that guitar sound okay in your thing? We moved, we yeah. had a little microphone movement here. Yeah. All right, here's one. It's the most recent one I've written, and it's really a simple tune. And it's called The Bulls at Pamplona. Everything happens to the guy next door. Sometimes the guy next door is you. You're walking down the street when out of the blue. Everything happens to you Everyone you meet is the devil in disguise Or an angel unrealized Might take a lifetime for you to know the truth Or you can see it in their eyes I always bet on the bulls at Pamplona Some things are so easy to see The rest of what remains Is a sweet mystery Only a fool makes long range plans You can't teach a stone to understand You can't block the sun with the palm of your hand You can't turn yourself into another man I always bet on the bulls at Pamplona Some things are so easy to see much of what remains is a sweet mystery everything happens to the guy next door sometimes the guy next door is you mic back on man i had to take a second honestly Whew, okay <laughs> hey i do have tissues behind me i got a little misty eye there i gotta admit man that was that was, that was really beautiful the, where'd you come up with the line sometimes the guy next door is you um well you know i started to uh well you know it's just It's just the truth, you know. Everything out. Oh, it's too bad about the neighbor, you know. And then it happens to you, oh, you know. And the neighbor says, oh, "It's too bad about Jim," you know. Everything happens to to everybody. It's just it's a random occurrence, I guess, you know. Um, 
Well, you said the perfect word. It's a truth, you know. Yeah. I've never heard it in a song before, though. And so, mm-hmm. you know, I always like to see where these, you know, these phrases, which, which is, what's beautiful about it is because it is a truth, you know, which I think is why that kind of art, mo- and I'm, I'm, I'm easily moved, mm-hmm. but I, you know, I have affinity and bias here, but... Mm-hmm. Well, it moves you. Uh, it, you know, however you respond to it is legitimate, but I sure as heck didn't, uh, I wasn't going for that. It was just, a, like, you know, a guy sitting on a front porch talking about, you know. <laughs> and I don't know if, uh, you know, the, the the bulls at Pamplona is the only. Yeah. Is that a Hemingway reference? Because that's where it draws me to. <laughs> no. Of course, I have, I lean that way anyways. But. Well, every, you know, you've seen this every no, year on, in yeah. July. You know, they show new pictures of the people running from the bulls. It's a big international <laughs> thing. <laughs> and, you know, I, I said to my friend, uh, you know, I said to my friend, I can't believe what some people do. And he goes, ah, that's one of the things I can't believe people do. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so that's a thrill. People come from all over. I read up on it, you know, that people come from all over. It initially started at, uh, in, like uh, in the 14th century or something. Uh, you know. Yeah, they didn't have shit to do. Let's fucking get some bulls together and run. Well, now, that's you know. how they moved the bulls, you know. <laughs> Young kids would run and the bulls would follow them, you know. So naturally it became a ritual. Now it's a big thing where a bunch <laughs> of yuppies from all over the place who can afford to go to Pamplona go, there and they dress up. You have to have, dress up in white, and you have to have a red belt, and you run in front of the bulls. And every year you watch, and you know, they send the news, and it was the annual running of the bulls at Pamplona, and they show the thing, and there's some guys flying up in the Fucking air. Fucking asshole, Wait. Americans <laughs> getting bored. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so that's when I just thought, man, I'd always bet on the bulls. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, no doubt. <laughs> I, I think, uh, yeah, I, I, I didn't want to say it, but I'm going to say it now because we went there. But I always, I root for the bulls. And I always take some satisfaction. I, I don't ever want anyone to get seriously hurt. Yeah. I'll disclaimer it. But I like to see. Sometimes I like to see a yuppie get gored by a horn. Yeah, man. Man. I mean, I, you like, know, get I like thrills. I like uh, <laughs> to make my own oxytocin and shit like that. But. <laughs> I ain't gonna do that. <laughs> no. I wonder what this volcano looks like yeah, from up here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, the. References in there. The, uh, I'm not using the proper terminology. The it was it was in it was in uh, roll on also these the, your phraseology. I'm gonna shut up because I'm I, I'm I have to process the thought more before I can say it. But the way your lyrics uh, roll into and it's connect. Uh, I'm having again trouble saying it, but they're connected mm-hmm. within the stanza of each. I always use. Poetry terms, mm-hmm. you know, and people use. Uh, I got a little bit of a hum there. I'm hearing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm gonna turn this microphone down. Uh, but I always use. I don't ever know. I always. I never know if the music terms I'm using are actually music terms or they're writing terms. But you, we always understand what we're saying. The stanza of that phrase of each thing has this thing that starts in the beginning and then goes to the end, and it's connected within that phrase. And then within the whole song, which is obviously somewhat what song making is, <laughs> okay? Mm-hmm. But you've done it in such a you know masterful way. Your lyrics are so. You said it already. It's they're truths. In, yeah. in the roll on, it was the same way. Mm-hmm. I want to hear another song now. Can you play well, the whole fucking CD? Let's just record the whole CD, man. Anything that I did was a album. complete accident. You know, I just, <laughs> really, I just I write this stuff down, and I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> All right, here's one. You have another one? Yes. This one is... Mm. So we're about... uh, You take us out on this song? Yeah. This is a good one to go out on. What's it called? This one is called I Want to Be a Mobster. Let me get this... uh, Let me get the the, uh, guitar back in. I just want to put some like effects on it. I don't know how that's going to be though. No, nah, don't do it. Just be, keep it intimate. Just here. put a reverb there. It's, that's uh, too weird. Yeah. yeah. This job is grinding me. Yeah, you know. 
Yeah, I kind of like the intimacy of no reverb. I like reverb a lot when I'm recording. But sure. Yeah. <laughs> it's like singing in the shower. Yeah. This job is grinding me From a rock to a grain of sand I spin my wheels in mud Can't get the upper hand I raise my boys real strong I teach them right from wrong But it's the same old song Playing on the same old radio I watch my life just pass me by Will it go on like this Until the day I die I want to be a mobster I want to be a mobster I want to chew my ZD where the deal goes down I'm judging every pocket want to own this town Sparkle like a diamond when the sun goes down Push a pile of money to my congressman I want Tim to hear this one. I watch my life just pass me by. We go on like this until the day I die. I got my nose to the grindstone, my feet on the ground. I never back up, it's just pound, pound, pound. Mm -hmm. I wanna be a mobster. I wanna be a mobster. I wanna chew my ZD where the deal goes down. Judging every pocket, wanna own this town. Sparkle like a diamond when the sun goes down. Push a pile of money to my Congress band. That guy, that guy's in the audience. He's like that. <laughs> cynical. I love the cynicalness in your humor. I love that it's, this is a different, this is what I love about an album. So you've got these things that flow, and then you have a piece that's a different than some of the other pieces. Yeah. This one has a lot of guitar on it. I mean, there's not, not many lyrics. It's, uh, you know... It's got more things happening musically. Yeah. Is the, and so you had mentioned on the previous one different uh, elements to it. S same with this. How is that? Is there – is it heavy bass? Does it have, you know, what are the pieces underneath? Oh, it? it's it's a real homage to Steely Dan. You know, Gondel Fagan is a big – and so, you know, it, 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 it sounds kind of like that. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, I always dug uh, Walter Becker. Uh, he he – on. Uh, uh, Two Against Nature, I think it was. Um, he just, he, he did it a lot. He played guitar all the way through it. He played fills all the way through it. And there was not one note you would say, oh, that's too much. It was just great. He just had, you know, he wasn't a shredder, you know, but yeah. he could compose on the fly and have it be beautiful. And uh, so, you know, I, I like that. And so that's uh, one thing I... How many pieces are complete? Like, all three of these sound like they're complete pieces. Like, are yeah. there, I mean, you sh I've listened to some of them, you know. How many more do you have to be done to polish? When is the – I so I asked Frank uh, this week. I said, hey, man, I just got back. I'd love to have you on – we had talked about before, but I want to have you on the broadcast. And he was like, oh, man. He's like, why don't we wait till the CD is – you know, the album's done, the roll-on's done, and, uh, and we could do it then. 
And I said, let's do both. Like, let's come on and do it because then we can talk about the, that part of the process. How far along are you? When, when can we maybe expect um, these beautiful works? Well, um, last year <laughs> was my goal. <laughs> so um, Yesterday. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, this year before, hopefully before summer's up, you know, maybe before that. It depends. Um, my friend is recording me in his uh, basement, and he is also a musician. And so, uh, whenever he is available to do this, and not, you know, and he also has albums out. You would love his stuff. And so, whenever uh, he, he can, we, we, he can squeeze me in. We do it. And uh, so, we're almost almost done. And. Uh, Who's who's uh, where you, who's the guy? Because I want to uh, get maybe a shout out to him too. You yeah. said I love his music. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Mick Rogers. He's oh Mick. Yeah. Oh, Have Mick, you ever heard yeah, any man. of his stuff? No, I haven't. But I mean, I know him through you. Yeah. I've never listened to his. Oh, stuff. he's yeah. He's got a gift, man. He's really got a knack. He's iTunes. Is it is it any electronic? He's not put anything. In. Yeah. <laughs> he we gotta get to, we gotta get to that point where like sending links. Hey, check this out. Yeah. Sh- shoot it to you. Um. We should do this, you know. I want to help you do that with this album, if you, you know, if you want. Yeah, I, this stuff is. Mm-hmm. You, I, that's three pieces, and you got maybe five or six others. Yeah, yeah. Um, Are they all as complete as that? I'm fishing for another song. <laughs> oh, okay. I'll do. For... How about I'll do one more? <laughs> <laughs> I'll do one more. Okay. This song is called "Limited Love." got to get the tempo right because hey let's do this when you go ahead get when you go out though yeah i'll do that that lazy 70s 80s fade oh you know? cool yeah so prodders thank you thank thank franks thank jesus i can't even talk i'm so excited frank thank you for coming on today uh i i i'm looking forward to when it is complete you didn't give us a date people so you're just gonna have to no. chill you're gonna live on this love of this music on the podcast here until the album comes out but it's gonna be called roll on and we're gonna have him back on afterwards i'm excited for it i'll see you at sunday dinner potentially <laughs> this weekend and uh everybody thank you for listening you know this is a real uh, special episode for me so uh share it out there get you know fpc man let's get fpc in uh, some of this some of this beautiful roll on music out there into the prodder universe share like subscribe facebook itunes podcatcher spotify yada yada send the links to each other and uh catch out if you're in the greater ward youngstown area uh or in kent or some other places you know frank castellano was out there live playing he plays at places uh in austin town he's at the manor a lot of times he plays the big band in kent frank what's the name of the place uh, uh there's venice cafe yeah yes yeah, uh, may 7th i'll be at the with, playing with an 18 piece band i've been doing that for about 10 years you got to come out and catch that one of these nights it's i need to i bad. need to what, what day is that uh tuesday night yeah so seven this will probably premiere after that so is it every three weeks oh uh no the next time will be june 6th um at, at downtown kent outside they have kent fest or whatever they maybe call i'll it. try to get this out yeah. even beforehand to try to get the thing for the seventh if not june check out the venice uh check out frank castellano also at frank yeah and i also yeah i also uh Put, put stuff on Facebook and, you know. Check out Frank Castellano on Facebook. We'll share some links, too. Uh, this song is called Roll On. Thank you for prodding with us in, in you know, the universe. This one, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. This, yeah. This one's called Limited Love. Uh, limited Love. Uh, Prodders, thank you. You're not living on limited love here at the podcast. Until the next time, stay electrified. I got limited love, limited love, limited love Emanating from this minimal heart of mine I got limited love, limited love, limited love Emanating from this minimal heart of mine And that's how it's gonna be forever And that's how it's gonna be from now on This minimal heart will learn to carry on I got limited love, limited love, limited love, limited love emanating from this minimal heart of mine. And that's how it's gonna be forever. 
And that's how it's gonna be from now on This minimal heart will learn to carry on Well, I tried big love a couple of times It never seemed to work so well It starts off with a whisper It ends with a hurricane Bodies screwing everywhere Days of pelting rain No, I'm never gonna do big love again No, I'm never gonna do big love again Cause I got limited love, limited love, limited love Emanating from this minimal heart of mine And that's how it's gonna be forever That's how it's gonna be from now on This minimal heart will learn to carry on When I met a woman way back when She gave my heart a start Drove off with another fool And tossed aside my heart I got a little tiny wallet I got a little bit of money Now if I get a little lonely I buy a little honey A little touch of heaven And a few bad jokes And then she's off into the night And I don't have to meet her folks And that's the way it's gonna be From now on That's the way it's gonna be From now on Cause I got limited love Limited love, limited love Emanating from this mineral heart of mine And I got limited love Limited love, limited love Emanating from this mineral heart of mine And that's how it's gonna be forever And that's how it's gonna be from now on This minimal heart will learn to carry on Well, I tried big love a couple of times Then it never seemed to work so well Well, it starts off with a whisper It ends with a hurricane Bodies strewn everywhere, days of pelting rain No, I'm never gonna do big love again No, I'm never gonna do big love again Cause I got limited love, limited love, limited love Emanating from this minimal heart of mine Well, I got limited love, limited love, limited love Emanating from this minimal heart of mine And that's how it's gonna be forever And that's how it's gonna be from now on And that is it for the show today. Wow. Uh, I, I literally, I could have sat here and listened to Frank play all day. Uh, I want to hear those other tunes. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I'm biased. I get it. But really, I, I, I'm not biased. <laughs> I mean, those lyrics and the music that he put together in his original compositions, I was, I mean, legit, like flipped out a little bit. I'm like a little bit of a, lyri a lyrical snob. You know, I'm a writer. Uh, I'm a poet. I've written music. I've written lyrics. I've got a couple. There's some music somewhere floating around on iTunes Our band, yeah, yeah, Y E A H, yeah, that's an acronym actually for your escape artist heroes. Tim Drummond, Dan Dialio, Larry Infant, and the infamous Frank Castellano plays lead guitar on, on all these songs. <clears throat> Yours truly is the lead singer. Yeah, check it out if you don't believe me. Yeah. Um, Anyways, I'm, I'm a lyrical snob, man, and I was blown away. So I really hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you pass this episode around. Share it with your people. Share it with your friends. Uh, subscribe and uh, be ready for our next one because our next episode is also going to be a doozy. I'm not going to preface it because I want to say real quick thanks to Brandon Giovanni, MDI Studios. You need a website? This is the guy to call. MDI Studios, Brandon Giovanni. You can find out more at mdistudios.com. And lastly, but certainly not least, it's the weekend. Well, it may not be. You might be listening to this on a Monday. But we'll release this. It'll be the weekend or 
close to it. Modern Methods Brewery, right on Dave Grohl Alley. Great beer. Go ask for the Darlene. I keep saying the Darlene, like the Ohio State University. Just go get yourself a glass of Darlene. It's fantastic. It'll. You want to talk about mood enhancement? <laughs> I mean, Axio is fantastic. Darlene, whew. We'll have to have Adam. I know we're going to have Adam Keck on at some point. He is the mastermind and owner of Modern Methods Brewery, and we can sample. We'll we'll see what makes you feel better. We'll do some kind of non-scientific study. But Modern Methods Brewery, get yourself a beer, drink responsibly, drive responsibly, make sure you get an Uber or a DD. If you want to find out more, go to modernmethodsbrew.com, see their hours see their events it is a great time enjoy a beer or two and hey if we're there myself brandon or anybody feel free to buy us a beer we will not hesitate to accept until then prodders out in the podcast universe we love you until the next show stay electrified (laughs) 